Well, good evening, everyone. It is good to see you here. It's Thursday, the 2nd of December. We are glad that you're joining us for the series entitled The Message of the Sanctuary, Foundation for Our Faith. Tonight, we have Dr. Professor Irji Moskala. He is originally from the Czech Republic. He's been a pastor, a teacher, and administrator. He obtained his first doctoral degree at Charles University in the Czech Republic, and his second one about 10 years later at Andrews University, where he has taught religion at undergraduate and graduate level, and is currently the Dean of the Seventh-day Adventist Theological Seminary. He is a father. He is husband, of course, first, and then a father. <laughs> he is a wonderful man. I've had the privilege of taking classes with him, and I have to tell you that if you are to attend his classes, you never leave the same. I've said this for every teacher because that's a reality, and I will affirm it from personal experience as well. Dr. Moskala has been very gracious to adjust his schedule, especially for tonight. He had to attend another major meeting and managed to find a substitute. It's almost like in any sports game. So we are privileged to have Dr. Moskala with us. Thank you for joining. To all of you uh, who are here with us on Zoom and with you who are on YouTube, we are glad that you're here with us. Remember, tomorrow we have another presentation and you do not want to miss one that is related to our personal journey through the sanctuary. While tonight, Dr. Moskala is going to take us through some shocking news about God. Tomorrow, our friend Dwayne Esmond, a doctoral candidate and currently associate director at the Alan White Research Center, is going to take us through his personal journey through the study of the sanctuary. And please join us at 11 o'clock Eastern time on Sunday, oh, sorry, Saturday, Sabbath. Uh, Dr. Richard Davidson, uh, another professor at the Theological Seminary at Andrews, will take us from in one eternity into another using the illustration and the message of the sanctuary. So once again, thank you, Dr. Moskala, for joining us. Thank you, everyone who is here with us. As usual, we will start with prayer. And do remember, if you have any question, you feel free to send them to me. I'll get them. I'll ask them on your behalf anonymously at the end of the presentation. And if you're watching us on YouTube, you can also write your questions in the live chat. Let us pray. Dear God, thank you that tonight you gave us the time and the privilege to be together with you, with each other, and especially to hear a message that you have for us through Dr. Moskala. First of all, thank you that he has the opportunity to join us. Thank you for the privilege to have him with us. Thank you that the knowledge of research and study of the Bible and books related to the topic of the sanctuary, he has been able to put together for specific purpose tonight, good news about you and your attitude toward us sinners so that we don't have to live in fear, but in love and peace with you from this life into eternity. Thank you for the good news of Jesus, and thank you for what we're about to hear. Bless us, bless our presenter, is what we ask and pray in your name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Dr. Moskala. We look forward to the message, and may God bless you abundantly as you present to us. Well, thank you, Dr. Leftarov, uh, for introducing me. I am really thrilled to be with you. So a cordial greeting from Andrews University, from the Seventh-day Adventist seminary to all of you and I am so glad that we can speak about pre-advent judgment about judgment Happy speaking about I think it's um, the very very good news right well uh, not for many people but uh, I hope that um, at the end of my presentation you will praise the Lord that he is our judge and as you know the topic is very specific for us today. It's really about the pre-advent judgment, judgment before the second coming of Jesus. And the title is Shocking Reality of God's Affirmative Judgment in Cosmic Perspective, the Good News of the Investigative Judgment. So maybe I can rephrase it and say, how to expect um, God's judgment without going crazy? <laughs> yeah. Well, we know that God is our judge. Uh, so um, let's now reflect it. And um, more specifically about um, that pre-advent judgment 
and then how to put it into whole scale of uh, God's universal judgment. Well, uh, I would uh, probably I would uh, enlarge the screen here uh, to have it um, bigger that you can see it better. And now uh, let me tell you that some Seventh Day Adventists think that Advent judgment is not biblical, and it's uh, too Adventist, and that the year 1844 is very distant and thus no relevant for us today. It was in 19th century. We are in 21st, so so what? So what? But I think it's a very crucial, very important, and um, let this so one hour we will reflect on the word of God will really lead us um, into better understanding of the word of God. You know that Adventism started with a great expectation of the second coming of Jesus Christ in 1844. Then came the great disappointment. But our pioneers later understood that what described in Daniel 7 and 8 relate to activities in the heavenly sanctuary. And the key passages for it was Daniel 8, 13, 14, and Daniel 7, uh, 9 to 14, and also Revelation 14, 7, and some other important texts. We cannot go through all of them. And in, uh, of course, Daniel 8, 13, if I translate it uh, literally, it stated, until when? Until when the vision um, about this uh, daily, about the transgression desolating uh, uh, until when um, you know these powers will give uh, the both the this anti godly powers uh, to give um, both the sanctuary and the host a trampling so this is literal and the answer you know to that question was until uh, 2300 um, uh, evenings and mornings so Yes, when will the vision, uh, uh, especially about the or with the little attack on the sanctuary ministry of the princes and on uh, his people come to an end? And what will follow? This is the question, and the answer is very clear. Yes, until 2300 evening and mornings, and then the sanctuary will be. And now this is very difficult to say it in English. In Hebrew, we have the word nitzdak. And the best translation would be, and the sanctuary will be nitzdak. But nobody would understand when we will say that, right? <laughs> and in order to translate this one Hebrew word nitzdak, you need to have at least four, not one, two, but four uh, English words. This word uh, nitzdak in Daniel 8.14 uh, has a special form. It's a unique form in, in the Bible. And um, first of all, in English, it means to cleanse. And it is built not on, uh, only on the King's Daily Version translation, but on old, very old translation like Septuagint. Uh, before Christ, Septuagint was uh, translated. This is translation from Hebrew to Greek, and it was already there. And all ancient translations of uh, and sanctuary will be cleansed. Then it means also that sanctuary will be justified, and that just the uh, sanctuary will be restored to the original purpose. And then that uh, also uh, the sanctuary will be vindicated. So what does it mean when we speak sanctuary will be cleansed, uh, justified, restored, vindicated? If you look Daniel, uh, this chapter, Daniel of, uh, Daniel 8, and uh, put it into the uh, proper perspective, you will see that it's matching with Daniel 7. And in Daniel 7, you have these four animal kingdoms. Then you have the appearance of the little horn. And then the heavenly judgment is there. The most beautiful, elaborate, eloquent, uh, scenery about the heavenly judgment in the whole Bible you have in Daniel chapter 7. And uh, this Daniel chapter 7 is in parallel with chapter 8. And you can see also the animal kingdoms. Then you have Middle Persia and Greece. Then you have also little horn, the same little horn. 
And then instead of speaking about the, um, uh, you know, heavenly judgment, it's speaking about the cleansing of the heavenly sanctuary. And from here, from this parallel, you see that actually animals are the same, little horn is the same. And so heavenly judgment and cleansing of the heavenly sanctuary is also the same event. So it's um, the cleansing of the sanctuary, heavenly sanctuary is dealing with the problem of sin, with the issue of salvation. And uh, so um, this is this judgment, pre-advent judgment, judgment in heaven, which goes right now in, in heaven. And uh, when you put uh, Daniel chapter seven, eight together with chapter nine, then you know when this uh, judgment actually starts. That is um, after 1798, it's in 1844, because 70 weeks prophecy was given um, as a part of this 2300 evenings and morning prophecies and uh, from 457 before Christ um, uh, to the death of uh, Jesus uh, in the middle of the last week, uh, it was in 31 and 70 weeks ended in 34 with opening to mission to the Gentiles. And then um, this was like first part. And then the second part is with the heavenly judgment, with the cleansing of the sanctuary or pre-advent judgment, which starts in 1844, until, um, uh, the second, uh, till the close of probation or the second coming of Christ. So um, the Bible clearly speaks um, about the um, two phases of um, the sanctuary, which was the daily ministry and yearly ministry. This daily ministry was related to the um, uh, intercessory ministry of Jesus. And then yearly ministry was tied to the Day of Atonement with Rosh Hashanah. And this, uh, in you apply it to that big scale uh, of antitypical fulfillment, you know that the daily represents the daily ministry of Jesus for us uh, from the time of uh, his death, or better to say from the time of his ascension, when the heavenly sanctuary was inaugurated for this specific uh, purpose here. And the yearly was uh, from 1844. Well, uh, here it is um, how many Adventists see it from, the, um, uh, from their perspective. They think that there was uh, the death of Jesus, his ascension, and he started his daily ministry. How long? They think till 1844, and then I, 18, after 1844, start the yearly ministry, till the close of probation or the second coming. And let me tell you, that this interpretation is completely false, is wrong. What is right is that after um, uh, the death of Jesus, after his ascension, he started his um, priestly ministry as our intercessor, as our high priest, his daily ministry. And it goes not only to 1844, but it goes till the close of probation. And in 1844, what happened? Something was added to this daily ministry. And this uh, was now combined with yearly, which is the high priestly ministry of Jesus in the most holy place for us. If I would put it differently here, the, the top is wrong. The down uh, uh, scale is right. And you see that the difference is with that red line. This red line need to be only down from the line, not above. This is not the daily and yearly is separated by 1844. No, daily goes till the close of probation, till the second coming. And yearly is added, is something new, something special, which need to be done. And so if I would say differently, um, uh, Jesus is doing even right now the intercessory ministry for us in the heavenly sanctuary. And from uh, 1844, the yearly, this nitzdak, this uh, four meanings um, of cleansing, um, uh, of uh, justifying, restoring, vindicating, is adding 
this judgment, specific judgment, we call very advent judgment, which is there. So this daily ministry was enlarged to the yearly, yearly ministry. And it goes uh, in parallel way. If I would say it differently, that you can really see in the daily ministry, um, when uh, people were confessing their sins, these um, uh, uh, sins were going to the sanctuary. God took care of it. And the person was forgiven, who could glorify God. Glory, hallelujah to God. He, he forgave my sin. I am saved. But uh, yes, sin was there. Uh, the sinner could um, uh, rejoice about cleansing, about full salvation, complete salvation, but sin still exists. Uh, and the yearly uh, ministry was uh, bringing the final solution to the problem of sin. And uh, so um, this is very important. What Jesus is doing for us daily, yes, uh, he's interceding for us, uh, forgiving our sins, saving us, but now something is added to it. And he is now um, calling uh, the judgment in heaven in order to bring final solution to the problem of sin. Because if we are forgiven, sin, still, sin around us still exists. And uh, so um, Christ is now leading that pre-advent judgment in order to bring that final solution to the issue, to the problem of sin. And maybe I can say it in this way, that the yearly ministry, the day of atonement, uh, represents the pre-advent judgment, and that we need to make um, a clear understanding that pre-advent judgment is bringing cosmic, not only earthly, but cosmic solution to the problem of sin. Because by the death of Jesus, um, the whole universe is saved and by his um, ministry uh, in, in heaven. You know, let, uh, let me um, explain it in this way. There is a difference between sins, our everyday sins, and uh, between sin. There is uh, this difference in the Bible. The sins are everyday sins. Um, we sin, we confess, um, but we may sin again, or some people around us. There are many sins. Uh, but these many sins are expression of sin problem. And um, when uh, John the Baptist spoke about Jesus, he said, um, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away what? Not sins, but sin of the world. And of course, with that sin, all sins are forgiven and taken care. And this is the, the, the difference between sins, um, many, many sins, but the problem of sin. In illustration, I would say, it's like the difference between the personal racism. You know, we can confess our personal racism. We can be sorry for it. Um, we can uh, uh, abandon it, uh, repent, um, change. But this is my personal thing. But the systemic racism still exists. And um, uh, this is like that, um, you know, issue of sins and sin. And I hope that this can um, make clear. And uh, uh, Christ um, in the pre advent judgment is bringing that solution to the problem of evil, of sin. Not only like everyday uh, uh, sins, um, he is forgiving us, but now the issue of evil need to be solved. And this is the pre advent judgment all about. So now I would like to zoom with you on this divine judgment in, um, in the biblical theological perspective and how to understand. Because this is the spirit of judgment is the heart of eternal gospel, is the core of the Bible, center of the sanctuary message. And um, this is heartbeat of Adventism. So um, as you, you can see, it's a nerve system of Adventism. So how to really understand it. So maybe personal question here, after this revelation 14, six to seven, you know that when the everlasting gospel, three angel message is preached, this is the time of judgment. So today the three angel message is preached 
And this is the hour, the time of God's judgment. And this is um, what we preach is the everlasting gospel. So we live in the time of judgment. We have um, like the symbolic name of Daniel, God is my judge. And we are people of Laodicea. And you know that Laodicea is Laos and Dikea, it's people of judgment. And God is our judge. And um, I praise the Lord for it. And you will see why I am praising the Lord that he is uh, our God. So how to fit the pre-advent judgment into overall biblical teaching on judgment? So uh, because pre-advent judgment is only one part of the big biblical teaching of, of judgment. So how to fit? Now, this personal question. What are your first thoughts when you hear the word judgment, that God will judge you? What are your feelings, reaction, first impression? Well, don't speak to me now uh, theologically, but uh, honestly. And I have to tell you that I ask this question in all continents of the world uh, to people of different education, different um, uh, social background, different political background. And always the first answer was fear, fear. This is our natural reaction because God is holy, we are sinful. Oh yes, and we know that we are sinful, so we fear. We fear when we hear that God is our judge. And with that goes uh, the thinking of condemnation, punishment, destruction, death. What is common to all of this? The common is that everything Fear, condemnation, punishment, destruction, death is negative. All is negative. So we are thinking about judgment in negative terms. And this is our problem. This is our problem. Why? Why? The question is, what is really the primary meaning of God's judgment in the Bible? I don't want to deny that um, when God, um, uh, um, God is speaking about judgment, there is um, a condemnation, uh, punishment, death included. But this is not primary. This is a secondary meaning. And only when you do not accept the primary, then the secondary kick in. So what is the primary meaning? And I would like to give you quickly four definitions of God's judgment in the Bible. First of all, to judge means to justify. So when you are asking for forgiveness of your sins, you are going through God's judgment and God is pronouncing you just. He justifies you. So it means that you are no more guilty. You are pronounced just. You are forgiven, acquitted. Glory, hallelujah. Praise the Lord that he's our, our judge because our sins can be forgiven. It's like God's eschatological judgment is coming right now into our time. And when we are forgiven, we are justified, we are uh, cleansed, um, we are acquitted, we are no more guilty, pronounced just. Second, to judge means to save. Concept of salvation is there. You know, um, uh, um, God is saving us from the eternal death and instead is giving us eternal life. Wow, what a judge. The judge is a savior. He's giving you salvation. And this is very beautiful. Third, to judge means to deliver. Uh, he's not um, uh, only bringing salvation, but he's also bringing you freedom. We are all in uh, the um, slavery to sin. We are addicted to sin. This judge. Uh, who is justifying us and saving us is giving freedom to us from these addictions to sin, is delivering us from the power of evil. And fourthly, to judge means to vindicate. You know, uh, Jesus, um, um, uh, God as our um, uh, vindicator, as our judge, he is uh, personally standing against all the accusations of Satan. And he's um, vindicating us, um, saying very clearly, no, I am uh, 
here for that repentant sinner. So he's vindicating us personally against the accusations of Satan. When Jesus Christ was uh, hanging on the cross, Satan still could breathe. But in the moment when Jesus said, it is finished, Satan was finished. And um, uh, it's only a matter of time when he will be executed. So Jesus Christ personally, uh, through his death, um, uh, brought this vindication on us. He's for us and never, never against us. And we have, again, a text uh, for that, but I will not go through all of this. But I would like to prove it to you, that you will not say, well, this, um, uh, this definitions, um, four definitions that to um, judge means to justify, self-deliver, and vindicate. Um, are only, in, uh, you know, because I was reading uh, too many uh, theological books and uh, uh, studied theology. No, this is biblical. This positive meaning of God's judgment is in your and in my Bible. And I would like to prove it to you that this is like that. Quickly, a few biblical verses. The first one uh, is Daniel 7.22. This best uh, chapter about God's judgment pre advent judgment says in verse 22, Daniel 7, 22, and until the ancient of days came, and what happened? And the, the judgment was pronounced. This is um, the specific form in Aramaic, and judgment was pronounced, or judgment was made in favor of the saints of the Most High. This judgment was for them, not against them. And then later on in the verse like 25 is speaking about the negative judgment, judgment of condemnation on the little horn and those who are associated with him. So this is very powerful, very beautiful judgment in favor. So in the Aramaic language, uh, this chapter was written in Aramaic, you have the lament of advantage there. So it is for your advantage that there is a pre advent judgment in heaven. And this advantage is that God is for you. He is making a judgment in front of the whole universe for you, for in favor of you, because he is uh, justifying you, saving you, delivering you, and also vindicating. And this is powerful. Another book, Book of Judges. Who would think about Book of Judges, all right? In the association with judgment. But this is... Um, uh, a very good lesson to learn what does it mean uh, to judge. What was the primary function of judges? To um, punish, to destroy, to condemn? Of course not. These judges were um, there when people were crying to God, Lord, help us. Uh, these enemies are killing us, pressing us, destroying us. And God was sending judges. What was the uh, function of judges to deliver God's people from the oppression of the enemies, to bring liberty, uh, to bring freedom. They were caring for them, protecting, saving them. So the book of judges is actually a book of deliverers. And uh, they were bringing freedom. God's judgment is bringing that deliverance, that freedom. Do you know that in the Bible you have three prayers of David when he was asking God, Judge me, O Lord, in Psalm 7, 26, and 35. Like um, uh, in 35, 24, judge me, O Lord, my God, according to your righteousness. Is he asking, uh, Lord, please destroy me, punish me? Uh, no, he is asking, Lord, you justify me. You save me from the oppression of my enemies. Nobody is for me. Only you, please, you do it. You vindicate. You justify, you say. And God did it. So uh, we need to pray this prayer of David. The Lord, please judge me. And um, how many of you did dare to pray already in your life? Lord, please judge me. And I hope that um, after uh, today's um, uh, you know, study of the scriptures, you will pray that prayer because if you will not pray, Lord, judge me, you will never be justified, saved, 
delivered and vindicated by him. He is your judge. Praise the Lord for it, that he is like that. You see how excited I am when I'm speaking about judgment, because this is a really good news for you and for me. Another text in Psalm 76, uh, 8, 9. From heaven, Lord, you pronounce judgment. And the land feared and was quiet. Of course, this is our natural reaction. To fear and be quiet. Because he's a holy God. But um, when uh, God is coming to, uh, um, uh, to judge people, what he's doing? The text is continuing. When you, O oh God, rose up to judge, what he's doing? To save all the afflicted of the, of the land. So the judgment is salvation. To judge means to save. The same you have also in Isaiah 35, verse 4. And this is my favorite text. Because now God is saying to Isaiah, say to those with fearful hearts. And we all have this fearful heart. What we need to say to people with a fearful heart, be strong. Be strong in Christ, not in your power, right? Not in your achievements, if uh, in your accomplishment. Be strong in God, in Christ. Be strong in faith. Be strong. Do not fear. Why not? For God will come. Well, when you hear that God is coming, you already have uh, mixed feelings. And he will come in with vengeance. Now you are even uh, more fearful. And he's coming with the divine retribution. Now you are hiding. But when God is coming with vengeance and retribution, he's coming to do what? He's coming to save you. Glory, hallelujah. This is our God. This is our judge. He is for his people, never, never against them. It's only to stay with the Lord. And, uh, you know, we associate judgment with fear. But in the Bible, you have also the text when judgment is closely connected with joy. Let me read from Psalm 96, verse 11 to 13, and only verbs. Rejoice, be glad, resound, be jubilant, sing for joy, sing before the Lord. And why to do it? Because he, God is coming. He comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world. You see, judgment and joy goes together and uh, we want to be in that uh, big crowd which will be rejoicing and be glad and uh, sounding and singing with joy in the time of um, his second coming you probably noticed that so far i had all the text from the old testament because old testament is foundation of everything and you have this Great news about God that is for you, not against you. And what you have in the Old Testament, or better to say, Older Testament, you have also in the New Testament. Because there is a harmony there. And like in 1 John chapter 2, verse 28, or 1 John chapter 4, 17, you have that statement that in the day of that judgment, on the day of a judgment, or in the day of his second coming, we can have what? Parezia, which is a very good Greek word, which means bold assurance. So um, uh, this is why the text is saying, now, dear children, continue in Christ. Stay in him. Stay married with him so that when he appears, he may, you may be confident and unashamed before, before God at his coming. And love is made complete among us so when so that we will have confidence on the day of our judgment, because in this world we are like him. You see, this is this parousia, full, bold assurance, confidence, even on the day of judgment and on the day of the second coming. So when I speak about God's judgment, I see God's smile for his people, because Romans 8, 31 says, if God is for us, who can be against us? Very powerful, very beautiful. Praise the Lord for it. Well, uh, and then this is the result. Then you have, have um, full assurance of salvation and joy of salvation. So um, 
Now, um, uh, you can have this experience only if you understand um, your understanding of God's judgment is rooted in the cross of Jesus, not in your accomplishments, in um, your self-confidence, uh, in uh, yourself, um, but only in Christ. So let me uh, now explain more. How is divine eschatological? It means the judgment of the last days, this eschatological judgment usually presented by pastors or by teachers. How is it done? They speak about three uh, phases of God's eschatological judgment, right? What they speak about, about the pre-advent judgment from 1844 on till today, and uh, then speak about the judgment during millennium uh, when we will be in heaven. And then they speak about the final judgment when all uh, sinners and uh, sin and evil angels and Satan will be destroyed. Three phases of God's judgment. And uh, uh, now uh, let me uh, tell you that this is a very big shortcut. Uh, this is all biblical. Um, you know, there is a pre advent judgment. There is judgment during millennium. There is a final judgment. But this is very narrow biblical understanding of judgment. We need to do better job. Biblical data speaks differently. Otherwise, why? Because the three eschatological judgments, uh, which I mentioned before, and the date of 1844 is solidly biblical based on Daniel 7 and 9 and other biblical texts, but it is uh, not enough. There is much more about God's eschatological judgment in the Bible. You know, uh, these uh, three judgments um, are good as for the events, but this recognition is wrong for the starting point of judgment. Because in the year 1844, God's eschatological judgment did not begin, did not start. What started was only pre-advent judgment. And there is this difference between the pre-advent judgment and the eschatological judgment. So let me explain now. Let me repeat that there is a difference between the eschatological and time judgment which is big in scale, and then the pre-advent judgment, which is only one part of it, which started in 1844, yes. So when does start the eschatological end time judgment, if it is not in 1844? So when it started? You know, the classical understanding Standing is yes, well, uh, it's uh, this eschatological judgment started in uh, um, uh, 1798 or 1755 or 1844. But no, biblical answer is that eschatological time arrived with the incarnation of Jesus, with the birth of Jesus, with the cross of Jesus, with the first coming of Christ, the incarnation. This is that. Um, when the um, uh, really eschatological time, this last days really started. I would like to prove it to you that it's not from my, my head only. In Hebrews 1, 1 to 2, it stated, in the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by whom? By his son, Jesus Christ. So it is about his uh, earthly ministry on uh, on on earth. Um, um, you know, his uh, earthly ministry when he was here. This last day started from incarnation. In the last days, Peter was uh, preaching, and the Pentecost uh, is stated that the Holy Spirit will be given, and and the Pentecost was uh, already uh, fulfillment of that text. Uh, the last days were already there, already there, according to Acts 2.17. In Hebrews 9.26 is written, let me read the last part of that verse. But now he, Christ, has appeared once for all, when? At the end of ages, to do away with sin 
by the sacrifice of himself. This is the cross, reference to the cross of Jesus. So with the cross of Jesus um, um, came the end of the ages. So let me now tell you something very important because maybe you are now thinking, well, how it matching all together? There is a difference between uh, the eschatological time, general eschatological time, and then specific eschatological time, time of the end. And um, uh, this uh, um, eschatological time, this is one big umbrella uh, with a general and then specific is under that umbrella. It's complementary, it's not contradictory. It's uh, really fitting together. And um, uh, this eschatological general time started with the first coming of Jesus and the specific one was um, like added to it, um, uh, has a focus on the last day's uh, time. And uh, it's, uh, it's from 1798. It's like from uh, the French Revolution on, if uh, you would um, say it in the general terms. And this term, you know, technical terms, the time of the end uh, in Hebrew, at cats is really used only five times in the Bible and always in the book of Daniel and always referring to the time uh, from after the uh, French Revolution on 1798. <clears throat> so as you can see, there is a difference, um, but there is uh, not contradictory, but complementary. The last days, the end of the ages are, come, are here from the cross and the time of the end, uh, you know, so speaking uh, technically, it's from 1798. This picture can probably help you to uh, visual, visualize that. From the first coming till the second coming is at the general eschatological time. And then from 1844, as you have this um, black arrow, uh, it's from 1798 is that uh, specific apocalyptic or prophetic eschatological time of the end. All right, so if we understand that, uh, we can uh, see clearly that we have a correct biblical teaching about pre-advent judgment and the date of 1844. This is correct. Um, but the event um, uh, is very often isolated from the uh, most important and very crucial point, and this is the cross of Jesus Christ. And we cannot do that. We cannot dissect it. We need to put it together, and it fits beautifully and nicely. The cross of Jesus must be the central point, and um, the um, uh, incarnation, the cross of Jesus is the beginning of the eschatological time of this time of the end uh, this uh, this uh, the days the last days the end of the ages this was inaugurated and then you have specific time of the end um, from uh, the french revolution on so the cross of christ jesus christ himself must be the starting point of all our discourses of the divine judgment please uh, remember that the year 31, the cross of Jesus, not 1844, has to be the foundational and beginning reference point of God's eschatological judgment. Because there is no dichotomy, discrepancy, tension, um, uh, you know, between uh, the cross of Jesus and the pre-advent judgment, AD 31 and AD 1844. You do not need to choose between cross or pre advent judgment. Both are matching nicely together. They need to be put together in the proper relationship and perspective. And the starting point of God's eschatological judgment is the cross of Jesus, is AD 31. And um, I would love that you will remember that. And every time when you speak about judgment, you will never start with 1844, but with uh, the cross of Jesus, because here is the starting point. And I will show you more about how important it is and how it's matching in that big cosmic biblical scale. 
So it is better way to preach about God's judgment. It is crucial to connect divine judgment with the cross of Jesus. The cross is and must be the central point for all our doctrines. And I would like to plea with you, never, never, never present judgment without the cross. And the cross must be that central and starting point. So um, uh, I will say it now very strongly and um, uh, that you will really remember it. And I really mean when I say it, to preach and teach about God's judgment and start with 1844, uh, it's uh, really a grievous sin. Neglect to put Christ at the center result in a religious crime. Why? Because people then live in the spiritual schizophrenia. In one sense, uh, you know, people will hear, yes, uh, Jesus died for you, you are saved. Um, glory, hallelujah. But then we'll say, well, but remember, there is judgment. And suddenly this um, 1844 is um, dissected from the cross. And um, then all this beauty of life in Christ is melting down. This was the problem, for example, for Gary Ratzlaff, who was our pastor even, and then became like the, the one of the critics. And he speaks about the cultic doctrine of Adventism, referring to the this pre-Advent judgment, this judgment we are talking about, which is so important and so needed in, in our life. So let me say something more, maybe, uh, uh, hear the experience. Many years ago, I preached in Sydney about the pre-advent judgment from the perspective of the cross. And when I uh, finished uh, um, uh, and I was preaching about uh, this, what I am now presenting, uh, and I put uh, Jesus at the center when I was speaking about the pre-advent judgment uh, um, and uh, show it from the perspective of the cross, everything, then uh, when I finished, two pastors came to me and they said to me, you know, Dr. Moskala, if the message you presented tonight was preached in Australia 40 or 50 years ago, there would be no Desmond Ford crisis. You know, when um, practically he was uh, um, uh, trying to tell people, do you have to choose either the salvation in Christ um, uh, on the cross, or then this esoteric, uh, who knows what um, 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 judgment uh, with 1844. No, this is no discrepancy. This, this is uh, rooted, this judgment of 1844 is really rooted on the cross. So let me, um, uh, what I just uh, am explaining it, uh, put it uh, from uh, the, the biblical text here, Revelation 13, verse 8. The lamb that was slain was slain when? Jesus Christ died for us when? Historically, 2,000 years ago. But theologically speaking, from the creation of the world. And it's not only in Revelation 13, verse 8, but also in Ephesians 1, 4. This is biblical theological thinking. Jesus, the history of our planet Earth is actually in uh, the shade of the cross. And uh, so everything is pointing to the cross and is going from the cross. The cross is the central point of our history. And not only of our history, it's a central point for the cosmic um, uh, history. This is the most important event in uh, the whole universe. And of course, for us, um, uh, it's an event par excellence for us humans. Uh, so uh, let me now uh, show you uh, how this uh, centrality of the cross uh, need to be presented. But first, let me uh, give you also a very beautiful statement uh, of, of Ellen G. White when uh, she's um, writing the, the following statement uh, in the book of Gospel Workers, page 315. The sacrifice of Christ as an atonement for sin, this is the death of Christ on the cross, right? 
So this um, sacrifice of Christ as the atonement for sin is the great truth around which all other truths cluster. In order to be rightly understood and appreciated, every truth, every truth in the word of God from Genesis to Revelation must be studied in the light that streams from the cross of Calvary. And she says, I present before you the great grand monument of mercy and regeneration, salvation and redemption, the Son of God uplifted on the cross. This is to be the foundation of every discourse given by our ministers. So when we speak about judgment, also the cross must be the central point, foundation of our discourse, of our teaching. So, I am um, uh, now drawing here the big picture for you about God's eschatological judgment. As you can see, I am not bringing uh, here three phases of eschatological judgment, but seven phases of eschatological judgment. And everything is done from the perspective of the cross because Jesus Christ was slain, died uh, at the foundation of the world in the beginning of the world. So this is a theological number one, and then is a historical number one. This is the center the, all these phases, seven phases are celebration of the cross of Jesus. And I will go very quickly through this, um, this panorama here of God's judgment. The first one, the first judgment is that uh, judgment on the cross historically. 2,000 years ago, theologically, from the foundation of the world. And it is a central judgment and cosmic in the dimension. And you know that very well, so I don't need to um, uh, go into the detail. Because on the cross, who was judged? Of course, Satan, and was defeated, sin, and lost, uh, evil, and all of humanity, we were judged. And what was a beautiful judgment? What we deserved? He took upon himself, and what he deserved, he gave freely to us. Yes, surely he took up our infirmities, says Isaiah chapter 53, and carried our sorrows. Yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgression. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. And the Lord has led on him the iniquity of us all. Such a beautiful uh, uh, statement. So God proved on the cross to everyone that he is God of love, God of truth, God of justice, God of order, God of freedom, that he is the God of the oppressed, never the oppressor. And, um, and then comes um, uh, the second phase of God's judgment. Uh, uh, I call the pre-cross judgments. And this is that number two on the scale. And of course, now this is this Old Testament time. Uh, Old Testament when I would say this, um, uh, this example judgment uh, from the Old Testament. Uh, Old Testament judgment as um, a type and pedagogical tool to teach us what God values, what uh, has no future, what will to be destroyed, and what um, um, will survive and will go to eternity. So um, uh, judgment uh, in uh, the um, uh, Garden of Eden was the first judgment, uh, and um, God's grace was applied already there. And um, when um, you go from the cross, you cannot now jump from the cross directly to the 1844. You need have you need to have something in between uh, your response to the cross. And this is the number three here. This is uh, judgment during our lifetime, our response to the message about the cross. And I would like to call this judgment as for the character. Um, of, of this judgment, uh, what is the content of this judgment, then this is a decisive judgment. Because uh, in our lifetime, we do our decisions 
for or against Christ. And if we do for Christ, we have eternal life. If we do against, um, we are condemned. And uh, this decision, nobody can make for us. We have to make this decision. Satan cannot alter it or change it. Uh, parents cannot do it for us or children cannot do it for us. We have to make it. And God is respecting, never changing, respecting our decisions. So this judgment during our lifetime is decisive. And we need to say what we do with Christ. What if we accept what he accomplished on the cross for us or not. And if we will live and walk with him every day or not. And this is his invitation, invitation for us. And this is very important. This decisive moment in our life on that everything depends. Our eternity depends on our relationship to Christ. And uh, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. There is also another beautiful text uh, which uh, Jesus Christ said himself, most assuredly, John 5, 24, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life right now. If you believe, you have it. Not one day, you have it right now. And that person who believes in me, not only have eternal life, but will not come into judgment. It's passing from death into life. If you read the same text in the New International Version, you read that Jesus said, I tell you the truth, whoever hears my word and believes in him who sent me has eternal life and will be not condemned. He has crossed from over from death to life. So which text is right, which is correct? The first one, that you will not come into judgment or you will not be condemned. You know that uh, Paul is saying in 2 Corinthians 5.10 that we must all appear before the judgments you know, of Christ. So what is, uh, who is correct uh, statement? Um, shall not come into judgment or will not be condemned. You see that is judgment of condemnation here. Let me tell you that this is what I call holy ambiguity of the biblical text. In Greek, you have the expression the sentence um, uh, phrase, which can be translated in uh, this way, as we have it in the New Peter version, or in another way in uh, NIV. Both meanings are correct. Well, if um, just think about that, if you uh, believe in Christ Jesus, you will not come into judgment. What kind of judgment? Judgment of condemnation. Is it true? Yes, of course. Uh, which judgment is 100% of condemnation? Which judgment? The last judgment, right? Where are in the last judgment the redeemed? They are in the new Jerusalem already. So these who are redeemed will be not come into the judgment of condemnation, into the last judgment, because they are already saved. They are already in the new Jerusalem. And then in whatever judgment you can think, uh, if you are believing in Christ and staying and uh, marrying him and staying married with him, uh, you will be never condemned in whatever judgment it is. You will be never condemned because God is for you, never against you. And this is very nice. So you see, first is the preaching of the gospel, hearing. Then is a response, believing. And then is a result, having eternal life not uh, coming to judgment of condemnation and passing from death to eternal life. Wow, what a beautiful judge we have who is for us, never, never against us. Glory, hallelujah to him. Hosanna, to him be really the glory. He tells you that every time when people are hearing the word of God, there is a time of judgment. They have to decide every Sabbath, at 11 o'clock is a judgment hour because the gospel is preached and the pastors need to preach that gospel. Every preacher needs to preach that gospel and decisions are made for or against Christ. 
and not only in preaching, but every time when you speak with your friend and you witness, and they are now touched by in their heart and they're making decisions, they are making decisions for or against Christ. When you give Bible studies, when you witness uh, to people, there is time when they have to decide. And uh, this is the time of judgment for them. And if they believe, they pass from death into eternal life. It's so powerful, so beautiful. In order to make it clear, uh, imagine that this paper I have in my hand represents me and the Bible represents Jesus Christ. And um, I heard the good news about, uh, about God, that he is my creator, my redeemer, and I'm attracted to, to his love, to his grace, uh, forgiveness, caring, uh, holiness. Um, he's a just God. So I openly, sincerely, honestly confess my sin, and he accepts me. For how many percent he accepts me? Of course, for 100 percent he accepts me. And I am now in Christ Jesus. And I am hidden in him, and he's putting on me his white robe of his righteousness. And his righteousness is my righteousness, his perfection is my perfection, his purity is my purity, and his character is my character. I am now saved in Christ Jesus. And our Heavenly Father is looking up on me. Whom does he see? He sees his beloved son, Jesus Christ. I am covered by Jesus, his blood, by his righteousness. And the good news is not ending only here. It continues. Yes, we are safe. But then this grace of God is changing us. We are becoming more and more like him in character. Ellen G. White is putting it very nicely in Steps to Christ on page 62. If you give your yourself to him, to Jesus Christ, and accept him as your personal savior, then sinful as your life may have been, for his sake you are accounted righteous. Christ's character stands in place of your character, and you are accepted before God as just as if you had not sinned. Wow. If your heart is not now beating faster, I tell you, something is wrong with you. <laughs> Because nothing more beautiful than this uh, can be preached to you. This is the core of the gospel. We are safe in Christ Jesus. But in Ephesians chapter 2, you read even more that without Christ, we are dead. Um, in our sins, translations. And then comes the, this divine but. But because of his great love, he made us alive. He resurrected us. We were dead, but he resurrected us in Christ Jesus. And then comes this um, atomic bomb uh, text. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us where? Seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. And where Jesus is sitting? Where he is sitting at his at the right hand of the heavenly father. So when um, we are in Christ Jesus, we are sitting by faith, not physically, but by faith already in heaven. Wow, what a beautiful reality in faith. Yes, um, uh, it's already by faith, but not uh, face to face. Reality in faith, but not yet physical reality. Because the gospel does not end here. The gospel continues. What is now going on? We are, on, you know, on, by faith in heaven. But in heaven now has to go this uh, specific judgment. This is this pre-advent judgment. And uh, in order to secure our place in, uh, in heaven, and that Jesus can secure our place in heaven. And this is now this phase number four. This is this pre-advent judgment as for the time. And for the content, how we call it? Well, we call this judgment as investigative judgment. But let me tell you that this uh, term today is a very misleading term because people think, oh, investigative. So God is investigating now if I am safe or not. No, completely wrong. This is not the term we'd want to say that God is now investigating if you 
you are saved or not. You already are saved or not in Christ Jesus when you gave his heart to him. This investigative judgment is not for God to know um, uh, who is his, as uh, you, you know in 2 Timothy 2.19, he stated that the Lord knows those who are his. We are in him. He knows. Um, so uh, uh, how to understand this term investigative judgment? It's not for God that he's investigating. It's not for us that um, we are now investigating. No, we know that we are in Christ or we are not married with Christ. We know that like First uh, John 5, 12, 13 says, he who has the son, Jesus Christ, has life, and he does not have the son, and who does not have the son of God does not have life. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the son of God so that you may know, that you may know that you have eternal life. We can have this parousia, this uh, bold assurance. We know if we are married, with Jesus or not, if we divorce him or not, if we are walking with him daily or not. So this uh, is not for us, but this is for angels. This is um, how it is in Daniel chapter seven, it is clearly stated that this is a heavenly judgment and these heavenly beings are there according to Daniel seven, thousands upon thousands attended him, 10,000 times 10,000 stood before him. This means immeasurable number. And the court was seated. This is the judgment. And the books were opened. The life of uh, everyone. Uh, so uh, I would like to say that we need to, when we are preaching about pre-advent judgment, use better terminology. Because we are not preaching to, to angels. Um, um, we are preaching to people. Yes, we can say that for angels, this is investigative. Because what was like personally between us and God. Um, uh, this is clearly known by God and maybe by, uh, by um, uh, some other angels, especially our guardian angel. But uh, this is not known to, uh, to the whole universe. So he is now bringing that cases of ours there. So uh, how to now... Uh, make it clear what is that pre-advent judgment for angels investigative judgment but from god's perspective from you your and my perspective what is it this judgment and i would like to say that terms we are using are very important because by the terms we are conveying the truth concepts ideas and we need to choose the best terms to really bring the message clearly to people and from all discussions i have with my colleagues um, um, scholars and theologians i came to the conclusion that the best term for it is that this pre-advent judgment is affirmative judgment when jesus christ is taking our cases and is affirming in front of the whole universe that we belong to him that uh, yes we were sinners but we are now justified sinners and his blood is sufficient uh, for us it's affirmative judgment is affirming confirming our decision for him it's a demonstrative judgment he's not playing he's demonstrating that we really are in him it's a revelation uh, to, to the cosmos uh, to uh, about our life so Jesus Christ is taking our cases, presenting them to the heavenly court, and thus securing our place in heaven for all eternity in front of the whole universe. Amen and amen. This is beautiful. Well, um, there are this, uh, uh, I would like to show you a few pictures we are using about the pre advent judgment. And uh, you tell me or think about that. Do you like it or not? Is it representing what is in the Bible? Oh, well, uh, who is at the center here? The main um, person is uh, like uh, the sinner. Where is Jesus? Uh, so far from the uh, hopefully repentant sinner here. The sinner is right, 
but this distance between uh, Christ and the repentant sinner, oh, I don't like it. Look, look at here, where this uh, repentant sinner is looking. Instead of looking upon Jesus, upon his Savior, he's looking down. Or um, uh, you can um, uh, look also to um, uh, other uh, uh, you know, uh, pictures in our publications. Here is better a little, a little bit because it's in the shade, the sinner, repentant sinner is in the shade of the cross. But again, distance, looking down. Uh, look here, this poor girl. Again, not looking up on Jesus, down. Um, you know, all these um, faces of Seventh-day Adventists, you see how sad they are. No. Seventh-day Adventists must be the most joyful people on planet Earth. If we are saved in Christ Jesus, our faces cannot be from the north to south, but from the east to west, because we are in Christ Jesus. He is doing all these things uh, for us. And this is so powerful, so beautiful. So um, if you are a, a, an artist, please express it, this biblical truth much better. We need um, to have a better picture than his impersonal, sober faces, uh, distancing sinner from Jesus uh, and so forth. Maybe uh, you know we need to present um, a sinner in the heart of Jesus or in the palm of Jesus, um, uh, you know, or um, sinner Jesus who is embracing uh, the repentant sinner. Better, better, you know, to express the biblical truth, and this is so important. Well, uh, this is probably the best picture I, I saw. Uh, in uh, the in about the investigative judgment because if Jesus at least is embracing uh, uh, that uh, sinner even though it is not so powerful if you look to the whole picture you see on the left side it's a high priest and the, it's all about high priest what he is doing in the day of atonement uh, it is the central point and uh, the right side is not bringing that message so clearly as, as should be. I like that one. Uh, Jesus who is embracing uh, the repentant sinner because uh, this uh, sinner took him as a um, personal uh, savior. So um, uh, here um, uh, we have it. Uh, uh, that uh, we really, on the Day of Atonement, um, in the pre advent Judgment, we need to focus on what Jesus is doing for us about his high priestly ministry for us. And um, in this way, I would like um, now to um, uh, go to um, the um, uh, closing moment uh, uh, the, to show you the whole panorama. But um, uh, here in John 14, you have that Jesus said, I will go and will prepare a place for you. And uh, when I will prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me that you also may be where I am. And uh, it's not about physical place. It's, a, it's about securing our place in front of the whole universe um, uh, for all eternity that we can be there uh, with with. This is very important. So Jesus is preparing a place in heaven for us. It means that he is securing our place in heaven, demonstrating that we fit to be part of the heavenly family because of his transforming grace. It is an open, public, and transparent act of God on our behalf. He is our friend, and we can be sure about that. And then comes... Uh, you know, when we are saved and we are by faith in heaven, and then in heaven, Jesus secured our place in heaven during the prayer and judgment. Now he can come for us on earth at the second coming of Christ to take us physically into heaven. And this is this judgment during the second coming of, of Christ. Uh, and this is, uh, again, so uh, important, so powerful. And um, I don't need to uh, speak about the second coming of Christ because we are Seventh-day Adventists. This is uh, what I call 
a realization judgment. All our hope we had in Christ is realized. Jesus is back. And now he's taking us into, into heaven. And then comes um, the uh, point number six, uh, uh, phase number six with this judgment during millennium. And again, it's a celebration of the cross when um, uh, God wants uh, that um, uh, in that attestation judgment, uh, all redeemed are happy in heaven if their beloved are there or not, if uh, the enemies um, even may be there, that will be a big surprise. Uh, if they were wounded, they are healed now. And um, uh, during that uh, millennium, uh, 1,000 years, uh, they will be again uh, clearly assured that what um, God is doing is doing really according and was done according to love and God's justice. And then comes the phase number seven, and this is the last judgment. And this last judgment is an executive judgment when, according to Revelation 20 and um, uh, many other texts uh, in the Bible, all evil will be then eradicated. And in the last judgment, in the great controversy on the page 666, it's easy to remember, is stated that above the throne of God appeared the cross of Jesus. And in the panorama, in the light of, of the cross of Jesus, the whole great controversy is explained. And then at the end, every knee is falling down in heaven and on earth and under the earth and giving glory, glory to, to God. As it is beautifully expressed in Revelation 15, verse three and four, great and marvelous are your deeds. Lord God Almighty, just and true are your ways, King of the ages, for you alone are holy. Your righteous acts have been revealed. Uh, so um, God at that moment is, um, you know, eradicating by this uh, fire all evil, all uh, sinners, annihilating Satan and uh, evil angels. And uh, he is doing this alien task, this strange work, but necessary work, and then establishing the new eternal life without sin. When uh, God's um, victory is total, it's a moral power which, um, which won a victory of God's love, truth, and justice. Um, and then there will be no more death and sickness and crime and violence, so no more uh, cemeteries, hospitals, and prisons. No more sin, sinners, evil angels, and Satan. Wow, this is so beautiful. But it will be love and peace and joy, security and creative work, lasting, meaningful relationship, harmony, traveling uh, through the whole universe, and we will be with Christ forever and ever. Now the dwelling of God is with man and he will live with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. Yes, eternity with God. So, yes, all eternity, imagine all eternity with God, with angels, heavenly beings, from all today, from not only 120 billion galaxies, but they speak about uh, 350 um, billion galaxies and there is no end of it uh, with all redeemed from all ages. Um, and this is really in the gospel according to God's judgment. This is a celebration of the cross, putting every pieces together, the cross and 1844 and all eternity. And from that perspective, we can say yes, uh, um, uh, let um, God be glorified. Glory, Hosanna, and hallelujah to him. It's a celebration of the cross, celebration of the accomplishment of Jesus, celebration of the person of Jesus Christ. Amen and amen to it. Well, if you would like to have something more about uh, what I said in a um, uh, condensed form, you can read uh, about these two articles. Um, I published, they were, they were published in the Journal of the Adventist Theological Society. They're also published in uh, different books, uh, like uh, the Salvation Book, uh, 
um, published by Andrews University and uh, some other venues. So I will recommend that you will read this uh, two articles for more uh, insights of what I presented. So I praise the Lord for this gospel according to God's judgment. Thank you, Dr. Moskala. We are thankful that you gave us so much to think about, and yet the questions have not ceased. I have so many, and I will honor all of them. So brace yourself. Okay. <laughs> I'm sure you're used to those questions. Uh, question number one is, uh, what are some books you would recommend related to the topic of the judgment, including yours. I think you mentioned yours. Any other books that you could recommend? Uh, yes, uh, I would um, uh, strongly recommend uh, these two books. Um, uh, I am, uh, uh, we as seminary uh, professor were published. One is uh, called uh, Salvation. Um, then is Column, Contours in Biblical Soteriology. Contours in Biblical Soteriology which I have uh, the article about the meaning of sin. I have there also article about uh, the intercessory ministry of Jesus. Uh, and, uh, and, um, uh, and there is uh, also about perfection and judgment and, and all these things. And the second book I would recommend is uh, The Character of God and the Last Generation. This we published um, by Pacific Press uh, as a seminary. Uh, the character of God and the last generation. And there are also very important articles um, of my colleagues there from the seminary. And my um, article is there about the atonement and how what I put this uh, about judgment, how it fits to that big scale of God's atonement. Thank you. Second question. Is the sanctuary a place of judgment or salvation? And what difference do we, do we need to make between God being, a, uh, sorry, between God's judgment and God's judging? And uh, I did not hear the last. Okay. okay, so the first question, I mean, it's two-part question. Is the sanctuary a place of judgment or salvation? Okay, what... I would say it's both because uh, judgment is salvation and salvation is about judgment. You cannot be saved unless you are judged. And this judgment is actually going through either in positive or negative way. If it is positive, you are saved. If it is uh, negative, you are condemned. So this is like a uh, heavenly command center sanctuary. And from there, all God's activity is done. And the second part. And, and the second part was what's the difference between God's judgment? And God judging. Um, uh, God's judgment, I would say, um, this is like um, uh, the uh, um, biblical teaching about God's judgment. And God's judging will be the present form because it's a participle form. Uh, so God's judging is like presently doing, doing that. So if in the Bible you have um, this uh, terminology, you always need to put it into the specific time frame in order to to know what is the especially in the book of revelation you have that that the time of judgment has not yet come like uh, um, uh, in the book of revelation uh, the souls are crying to god people martyrs are crying uh, lord revenge us judge judge so judgment did not yet occur but then uh, it's um, that god is judging and uh, you know, uh, and then you have the result that has uh, is um, uh, hour of time has come is now judging, and then is the result of, of the judgment. Thank you. Third question: What are the major issues that non-Adventists have with the Adventist teaching on pre-Advent judgment, and how are we to respond to them? Well, I think that the major issue is that they uh, do not understand how it's fitting to the uh, issue of uh, justification and salvation. And I think um, uh, uh, that this is big misunderstanding. Uh, I had my professor at the university in Prague. And when I was discussing uh, this with him, 
he was actually very interested and he said, there is something here, there is something uh, more, and you need as Adventists, you need to uh, present it in the more relevant way. And this will be my answer to that question, how we should do it. We should do it from that angle of the cross of Jesus. Um, uh, because if we dissect it from the cross, people see, oh, really, this is, uh, you know, uh, too sectarian. It's, uh, it's only, only 1844. Um, and they need to see that our salvation is really um, um, rooted in Jesus Christ. And then from that perspective, as I saw it in the seven phases of God's judgment, it's really fitting. And each phase is very important. You cannot miss one because this uh, chain of God's uh, uh, salvation will be actually broken. And um, so in, in this way, we can really show them. And then it's very crucial to uh, demonstrate how Daniel chapter seven, eight, and nine are one unit. Uh, and in that way, especially chapter eight and nine, that uh, 70 weeks prophecy is part of the 2300 evenings and morning prophecy. That this is like one integral unit. And there are at least five good points how to demonstrate. Thank you. Uh, on your uh, biography, your academic biography on YouTube, on uh, the internet, mentions that your doctoral thesis at Andrews University is on the clean and unclean foods in Leviticus 11. So what are the major lessons we need to take from uh, that chapter? And what are the reasons what, why God separated clean and unclean? Is that physical, medical, health, religious? Okay, this is a very good topic. This is not um, related to what we are doing right now, but uh, I will be happy to, uh, to mention to, uh, the, the main lesson of that is that God is holy and we need to be as holy as is God. So he redeemed us, he made us holy. Not that we through the eating or not eating become holy. The chapter starts, you are holy. Therefore, so God saved us, made us holy. Therefore, be holy as I am holy. And this difference between clean and unclean food is done from the perspective of theology. God is our creator. And in the respect of our creator, we are following what he's saying. It's fitting for our um, consumption and what is not fitting for our uh, human consumption for food or not food. So this is very simple. So the reason is related to health, is related um, to many other things, but the main umbrella of it is respect for the Holy Creator, it's theological, um, very important theological uh, interpretation behind. Respect Thank you. Creator. Yes. Uh, moving to the next question. In Daniel chapter 9, verses 24 to 27, we read the prophecy of the coming of Messiah. Some interpreters see the devil or the son of perdition in this. Others use it to support the secret rapture. What makes them use this text for these particular interpretations? Well, uh, they are the, what they are doing is actually this, uh, our friend dispensationalist, uh, <clears throat> they are dissecting 70 weeks prophecy. And, uh, um, um, and um, the 70 weeks prophecy, they are taking 69 of them. Then there is a big gap. And then um, they're putting uh, the last um, 70 weeks. And this is something what we cannot support because this is um, uh, in the Bible is 70 weeks prophecy. It's uh, one unit and it's uh, no gap uh, between uh, the 69th and 17th week. Uh, so, um, because they are uh, putting there this artificial gap, uh, so uh, then they put this um, last week into uh, uh, after the long period um, of um, of uh, church history in, uh, to the last um, uh, events uh, on earth, and then they put uh, there uh, this um, you know tension and the Antichrist and so on. 
Yeah. So th this is uh, uh, what the Bible, the biblical text is not allowing that uh, we will take 70 weeks and put it 69 uh, with this period of time. And then so the 70 weeks there, 70 weeks need to be put together. And actually in that 70th week, according to the Bible, Jesus Christ in the middle died and fulfilled all the sacrificial system. It's fitting perfectly into the history, what the biblical text says. Thank you. Uh, next question. Is there both a holy and a most holy place in heaven, or are they the same? Because that seems to be quite a stumbling stone for some Adventists as well as non-Adventists. Well, I strongly believe that um, as God is real, and uh, so are angels real, so the heaven is real, so the heavenly sanctuary is real and heavenly New Jerusalem is real. We will be there uh, as a real people and, and so forth. Uh, so I strongly believe that there is also a real sanctuary, but please do not put it into the scale of the earthly sanctuary. We know in the Bible, the heavenly sanctuary is like the multidimensional and colossal place where um, uh, the um, representative of the whole universe are gathered in order to praise the Lord. And this is the um, center from which also God is um, not only uh, ruling over the whole universe, but also all things uh, related to our planet Earth are decided. So it's, um, it's a uh, uh, majestic uh, and a uh, huge place uh, um, robust one, uh, which we, in our own, uh, best imagery, even uh, uh, cannot come uh, close to it. And uh, so, uh, um, I can I can speak about this topic for for long, but let me give you one illustration. In the book of Revelation, you have no, in the book of Hebrews, you have stated that uh, uh, the earthly sanctuary was like a um, shade of the heavenly sanctuary. So now imagine and compare myself like a person with my shade. Okay, my shade is real, okay? It's um, speaking about me, who I am. It's my shade. It's um, a reality of me. But the big discrepancy between the, my shade and myself. And uh, this can probably help many people uh, to understand that the earthly sanctuary was only that shade and the heavenly sanctuary is a much bigger, greater. Like um, if I compare my shade with myself, uh, my shade cannot show all the dimensions of myself, cannot show my feelings, my thinking, uh, my plans, my desires. Um, nothing is there. It's only something uh, from uh, my reality. And this earthly reality, earthly sanctuary was only something uh, like an object lesson that we can learn what God is doing for us. So I strongly believe in the real sanctuary in heaven, but it's huge in, in scale. And yes, uh, God is doing things uh, um, for us. And the most important is for us, the function, what God is doing there in heaven, in the sanctuary for us. Thank you, Dr. Moskal. I have to acknowledge the presence of Professor Dr. Ranko Stefanovic, who was with us yesterday. And for all of us, I would like to remind you that you can rewatch these presentations on the YouTube channel Adventist Ontario. Continuing, please explain again the daily dash yearly ministry of Jesus, as you mentioned earlier in your presentation. Well, uh, you know, if you go to the uh, earthly sanctuary, God is um, uh, showing that uh, there were like two phases um, uh, of, um, of atonement. Uh, there was the um, uh, daily ministry in uh, the sanctuary, and then it was the yearly. Uh, this daily was going uh, every day, but yearly only once, uh, one day in the whole year, and this was called day of atonement and um, this daily ministry was uh, representing um, the daily forgiveness of uh, the people who confessed their sins 
but yearly uh, was there to bring um, final solution uh, to take um, uh, sin problem away from the sanctuary that it will be annihilated, it will be completely destroyed. So this is why I was showing that this daily is representing the ministry of Jesus, intercessory ministry of Jesus for us. This is this forgiveness of sins and um, uh, changing us as sinners uh, to his image. But the yearly, it's additional to the daily and it's um, uh, specific uh, things what God is doing right now in heaven to bring the final solution uh, to the issue of, of sin when he's explaining this uh, to the whole universe and uh, bringing every case of the person uh, to this judgment and showing if they are in, uh, in that positive or negative relationship with God. And it's an uh, affirma affirmation from, from God to those who are believing and then um, they are um, uh, um, uh, then saved um, for um, uh, eternity because um, uh, the, the whole judgment, heavenly judgment, is now affirming what God individually uh, was doing during the daily for them. And now this um, uh, yearly ministry for us uh, is securing our salvation and also is uh, showing uh, on the other side. Um, this um, uh, uh, work of the Antichrist and work of the evil, explaining um, that even though they're pretending to um, be good or pretending to serve God and even be playing God, that they are actually uh, playing uh, Antichrist, uh, playing devil, and uh, this is a destroying force. So all these issues, and there are um, much bigger issues, it's in the cosmic scale, which need to be understood uh, for the, the whole universe before this um, controversy between good and evil, light um, and darkness can be finished. And, and... Thank you. Uh, more questions. Uh, God is judging positively, but is this only for believers or unbelievers included as well? And um, under what can and under what conditions would judge would God judge favorably? Well, uh, God is um, uh, judging favorably only under the condition that we believe in Christ Jesus. Uh, nobody will be condemned um, on in the last judgment because he and or she is a sinner because we are all sinners. The decisive uh, action is that God brought solution to the, our problem of sin, and this is Jesus Christ. And uh, um, uh, the positive judgment is on the basis that we confess our sins, and Jesus Christ is taken um, uh, personally as uh, the savior of our life, and um, uh, then uh, Jesus Christ uh, becomes our savior, and uh, he is our own uh, personal friend. On that basis that we confess our sins uh, and um, we now are giving uh, our life to him, we surrender to him and we ask him that he will be Lord of our life. And we are now walking with him, um, uh, um, teaching, uh, learning from him, uh, following him, worshiping him, obeying him and uh, witnessing for him. This is that life um, which is uh, the life um, of um, meaning, uh, relevance, uh, uh, and blessing for other people on, on, on that basis that we are belonging to Christ, that we married with him and we stayed married. This is what, um, why people are saved. Thank you. Uh, moving on. Uh... Is the pre-advent judgment different from any other judgment of God as recorded in the Bible? I think that my presentation about the seven phases of God's judgment uh, make it very clear that yes, uh, there is a God's um, eschatological universal judgment. This is a big umbrella. And under this big umbrella, there are these different uh, phases of God's judgment, including um, uh, judgment on the cross, my personal judgment, 
um, uh, judgment, um, uh, uh, what we would say, in, uh, uh, like uh, affirmative judgment, uh, uh, this pre-advent judgment, then a judgment during the second coming, judgment during millennium, the last judgment. There are different uh, uh, aspects of one big judgment, uh, but each phase is very important to understand uh, in uh, not only time, but also in the meaning, uh, in the nature. Another question, what is the difference between justification by faith and investigative judgment? Well, uh, the, the difference is that um, when we say justification by faith, it means um, it's uh, telling us how God is saving us. It's um, uh, telling that uh, God is saving us, is justifying us uh, um, uh, through faith um, in Christ Jesus. So we are saved by the grace of God um, uh, through, uh, through faith in Christ Jesus. This is like the um, basic and very important definition. And when we accept Jesus, uh, he is giving us his uh, uh, righteousness. So we are justified uh, by faith. Better to say it's through faith because it's not that uh, faith is our savior. Our savior is always Jesus. And in a uh, Hebrew Greek language is an instrumental. It's a um, uh, it's um, like through faith in Christ Jesus um, by God's grace. God's grace is uh, um, why we are saved and uh, um, faith is the hand by it, uh, the salvation we are uh, accepting for ourselves. And investigative judgment, or better to say this affirmative judgment or, or pre-advent judgment, it's actually in, uh, the um, confirmation if um, we accepted Christ, if we are justified or not. And um, in, in this way, uh, if we are, um, uh, if, if I would say it in a simple language, as I use it several times, if we are um, uh, married with Jesus and stayed married, you know, sometimes I'm asking, well, what is easier? Uh, to marry or to stay married? Of course, to marry is very simple. You can marry every every uh, every day if you want with somebody else. To 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 marry is is very simple. It's a matter of a few hours. But to stay married, this is the art of life, and uh, this is what what we are meaning when we speak about uh, um, dedicating the life uh, to God. It's about commitment total dedication, total surrendering to him. And not only like one for hour, my, my wedding day, no. The wedding day is only starting day of um, uh, you know, life, everyday life. And this is um, how um, uh, we need to understand we were justified, but we need to experience this justification by faith or through faith every day. And uh, growing in that uh, justification, and this grows in the justification we call sanctification until glorification. Thank you. Uh, there are different theories that try to explain why Jesus died on the cross. For example, to satisfy God and God's law to prove Satan wrong. Is it possible that Satan actually? made Jesus go on the cross, and in this game, he had the stronger card. Could you please explain why would Jesus die and the theories behind it? Uh, yes, um, the church already for uh, 2,000 years is debating that question. Uh, Deus homo, why God became human and why uh, Jesus Christ died on the cross? And there are uh, many uh, different um, uh, Theories about that uh, is that like this is uh, satisfactory, in, uh, you know, on the theory, in, uh, moral theory, in, substitutionary theory, and uh, there are like seven, eight main ones. But I would say that each this uh, theory is usually right in what they are saying, uh, what Jesus uh, did, but uh, wrong in what they are denying because there is no one theory which will be able to explain all these multiple meanings of the um, death of Christ. It is there 
that he died in our place for us. This is the substitution. He is um, satisfying also all the demands of the cross. He is reestablishing the government uh, of, of the law. And he is uh, also showing the love of God this is the moral theory and um, uplifting the, the uh, righteousness of God. And I can go and go and on of it. And it's not that um, now he would be tricked by, by Satan. Satan cannot trick God, okay? Or uh, that um, uh, God would trick Satan. All these theories uh, which are there are taken from different uh, world, like um, um, uh, court or business world, uh, you know, and, and different uh, sceneries which can help us to see the beauty and the vastness of the meaning of the death, uh, meaning of the death of Christ. I would say that there is a, an, a, a science of the cross, and this science of the cross we will study through the whole uh, eternity. And every time we will study that science of the cross and redemption, we will find something new, something surprising something which will bring us in awe of God. And we will say, well, your ways, your love, your justice, uh, your truth is so beautiful, so magnificent. And uh, the whole eternity, we will discover more and more nuances and depthness and uh, heightness and whiteness and brightness of, of this love of God. Thank you. Does God judge or is probation an act of God's love and mercy? That is to say, is God's justice equal to God's mercy? Well, I would say that um, only God know how to blend uh, love and justice. We have, uh, we have always um, uh, tension between them. We either um, see love or justice. And uh, God on the cross shows um, uh, the justice of God, uplifting uh, the law of God, the justice of God, and at the same time showing love um, uh, that he is able to save um, uh, sinners because um, uh, of, of that um, faith in Christ Jesus, because of this grace of God, which is changing us to the image of God. And uh, so it is not uh, just um, justice and love of God cannot be played against each other. Uh, this is um, one God who is um, both love and is also just. And um, uh, uh, he shows his um, uh, grace, uh, uh, expression of love to those who are accepting him as personal savior but he also is showing his justice uh, to those who are uh, uh, you know, staying stubbornly in sin. And this is that con uh, condemnation for, uh, for to the stubborn sinners. So yes, um, both uh, elements are important. And in uh, Christ Jesus, um, you have this kiss between the love of God and the justice of God together. Thank you. I'm uh, going through the questions that have come to me through Zoom, and I'll move to the YouTube questions, and thank you for your time. Uh, the other question that we have is, does God determine in advance who will be saved and who will be lost, who will accept and who will reject Jesus? Is salvation predetermined? Oh, yes, uh, this is an excellent question, and um, I would say on the basis of the biblical message, as I know, no, there is no, uh, nobody is predetermined either to um, uh, salvation or eternal perdition. God is not the one who is, uh, um, uh, you know, um, making these decisions without um, uh, taking into consideration our decisions. And what is beautiful is that even though we are dead in our transgressions and in, uh, in sins, with the message of the Gospels come at the same time the uh, enabling grace of God that we are able to um, uh, respond to this um, uh, 
in the message of the gospel. And uh, God is giving us this ability to respond. And it's on us if we respond positively or negatively. And we, if we respond positively, we are saved. If we respond negatively, we are lost. So yes, God is not predestined anybody to eternal life and others to eternal death. It's um, God is a sovereign God, but at the same time, he's also respecting our freedom and is giving us ability to respond. Not that there will be this ability in us, but with the, the preaching of the gospels comes to us this enabling grace. We call it prevenient grace uh, for those who would like to have a terminal, uh, a special term, term, term for, for this grace. This prevenient grace is enabling grace. It's coming from God, and um, we can now decide uh, to choose uh, if we will follow God uh, or stand against it. Thank you. Uh, you made a comment uh, that, based on Ellen White, that uh, if we accept Jesus, his character stands in place of my character. But what if I don't feel this reality? What if I feel still a sinner, bad, guilty, not even convinced that this reality of Jesus' character standing in my place is really my, my condition? How shall I deal with this type of feelings, especially if I believe that Satan accuses me rightly before God for my sins? Well, uh, you should not believe Satan, uh, what he's doing. You need to not focus on him and his activities, but on Jesus Christ, what Jesus is doing for, for you and for me. Uh, so uh, my response to that person is, please do not be preoccupied with yourself. Do not be preoccupied with what Satan is doing. This is not relevant. What is relevant is what Jesus is doing. Focus on him. Like um, if you would like uh, uh, that uh, in the um, uh, room, the darkness will be gone. You cannot uh, now focus on darkness and the darkness go, go on and go on. Uh, what, um, you, you will not do anything uh, if you will um, uh, fight with the darkness or you, you, will, you will try to, um, uh, to convince darkness to go on, to shout to the darkness. Uh, what you need to do is to switch a light. And, and this, is, uh, this is the whole purpose of Christ, to relate to him, to be in him, accepting him as a personal savior. And then um, comes the feelings. Of course, um, uh, you uh, do not, or you should not rely on your feelings. You need to rely on God's word. And if God is saying, confess your sins, and that uh, Jesus, like in the first John 1, 7 and 9, is saying, if we confess our sins, God is right that he will forgive all our iniquities. So um, if God is saying that he will forgive when I confess my sins, we need to believe it. And this is a reality. If I feel it or not, believing is first. And then if we believe, will come the right feelings. But we cannot rely on feelings. We need to rely on God's word. God said so. And because God said so, this is what counts. So let's focus on Christ, on what he is doing, and not on our feelings and our failures. Let's see the victory of Christ and accept this victory of Christ on the cross for us personally. Thank you. Uh, in the Old Testament, when people offered sacrifices, did they have a concept of Messiah? Many times, many times people speak of maybe they didn't, maybe they knew. Did the Old Testament people have concept of Messiah? Uh, well, this was the intent from the very beginning. Uh, and uh, like if you go right to the book of Genesis, uh, you have the story about uh, how in place of Isaac, was sacrificed the ram. And um, this was uh, the teaching tool how um, the human person does not need to die, but uh, somebody else is dying instead of, of human person. And then you have the story about the Exodus, 
when in the tenth plague, now uh, people of God, Israelites, had to sacrifice the lamb, and this um, lamb um, blood was taken as a sign of protection, and um, this um, blood was actually pointing uh, to the Messiah, to to the redemption, and you have it actually already in. Genesis chapter four, when you have the sacrifice of uh, Cain and sacrifice of Abel, and um, uh, Cain uh, was rejected with his sacrifice, but Abel was accepted by God with his sacrifice, bloody sacrifice. Why? Because he humbly presented this bloody sacrifice as the um, uh, solution to uh, the problem of sin. And so it was right there as uh, in chapter three already, God himself was giving uh, this uh, garment of skin uh, to Adam and Eve, which tells you if it is skin, it must be taken uh, from, the, um, from the animal. This is allusion to the uh, uh, sacrifice already. And in that garden of Eden or on, in that time when they were going out, um, Jesus was teaching them um, that uh, this uh, sacrifice is actually pointing to him what he will do for them, what they could not do for themselves. And this is actually in that um, first gospel, Genesis 3.15, that the enmity will be put between you and between uh, the woman. Uh, and uh, then it's very clearly stated that uh, that seed of the woman, which is that promised Messiah, will um, crush um, the head of, of Satan, of the serpent, but uh, Satan, um, uh, the serpent will bite back. And this was actually what happened on the cross. Yes, the, the blood mm -hmm. has a very important meaning in the Bible. And um, uh, um, uh, in many times uh, they lost uh, the meaning of it as uh, very, very often, when we do some uh, things without uh, rituals, without thinking, we can lose the meaning. But um, uh, God was teaching them that actually the sacrifices were representing the lamb, the Paschal lamb, Jesus Christ. Apostle Paul is speaking about that. And um, that uh, this um, blood of, uh, of Jesus is actually, um, you know, reminiscence of what, uh, the sacrificial blood was done, was doing in the sanctuary. Another question, what about the judgment for those who rejected God when the judgment started in 1844 and will go until it closes? What well, happens to those people? About them? Yeah, well, uh, I think that um, every uh, the pe person uh, through the uh, Holy Spirit and through different circumstances of life and through the preaching of the gospel, um, um, God is trying to, uh, to give this, uh, this chance to every, every person. And uh, if people uh, reject, uh, yes, um, they will be also condemned. Yeah. It's, um, it's very sobering that in the best chapter of the Bible is uh, gospel according to John chapter three, you have that uh, beautiful statement um, which says that uh, God so loved the world that he gave his only unique son that whosoever believes should not perish but have eternal life. But in that same chapter, the last verse um, is saying, uh, whoever believes in the son has eternal life, but whoever rejects the son will not see life for God's rest remains on them. Mm -hmm. It's uh, always a decisive, uh, um, uh, you know, moment in our life is what we do with Jesus, what um, reaction, what attitude we have to him. And on that depends uh, our life now and on then depends our eternity. I have to say there are a few questions here on YouTube. One is how important is the imputed righteousness of Christ in the pre-advent judgment in relation to judgment being by works? Um, well, uh, you know, those um, uh, who we are saved not by works, we are saved always um, by God's grace. 
but we are also judged um, uh, by works, which means we are condemned by works. If we do not accept God's grace, we are condemned by um, our, uh, our works, because our works is showing that we are not in relationship, um, a close, intimate, uh, loving relationship with God. And actually the, the meaning uh, we, we are, uh, that uh, how God is judging. Uh, we are saved by the grace of God, by condemned by our works. Okay, I, uh, you know. I do that, that question of about input, uh, imputed uh, righteousness. Yes, we, uh, we believe in the imputed righteousness and imparted righteousness. There are two different uh, aspects of the same righteousness of God. Uh, when uh, God is putting on us um, uh, God's righteousness, his righteousness, this is, uh, as I show it, in, uh, we are like uh, in the Christ Jesus, uh, like a paper in the Bible, is putting on us, imputed, is putting on us his righteousness, and then is becoming part, is imparted, is part of our life. And this um, is how uh, God's grace is actually, you know, a process. Um, this um, um, in enabling God's grace, which is coming uh, to us, is uh, saving us, uh, is changing us, is molding us, that uh, we, are, we are like him. And um, this is the beauty, and this amazing uh, beauty of God's grace. A few more questions. Jeremiah 2.9 speaks thine own wickedness shall correct thee that thou hast forsaken the lord thy god how can we ascribe what we call judgment to god well jeremiah uh, chapter 2 verse 9 and uh, appears that it uh, was quoted from the king james version well i will read from um, uh, let's say today's new international version uh, therefore, I bring charges against you again and declare the Lord. I will bring charges against your children's children. Uh, uh, yes, um, this is, reminds you uh, the second um, commandment uh, of God in the Decalogue, where um, God is um, uh, bringing judgment to those who are hating him and uh, it is this um, active attitude toward, toward God, not only in that first generation, but it's continuing. And it's all, also here. And I will bring charges against your children's children because they are staying in that stubborn, um, antagonistic attitude toward God. The other question is based on Matthew chapter 7, verse 2. For with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. And with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. Who does the judging here, God or us? Um, uh, yes, um, this is a very, very important text, uh, uh, which speaks about um, how we as humans, we need to live. It is about ethics. So it's not speaking about um, um, really God's judgment um, in... Um, uh, in per se, but uh, speaking about our attitudes. And it's telling us, be careful how you live, because if you condemn others very simply, easily, so um, God will also do this for, for you, because you have this uh, antagonistic um, attitude. And this is reflecting then on your relationship with God, because God is different. And in the same uh, sermon, um, uh, Jesus is explaining um, God is so merciful that he's giving uh, love even to his enemies, um, uh, to um, those who hate, and he is giving even to the wicked all um, uh, rain and sunshine and what, what they need for their everyday life. So in uh, uh, chapter 7, verse 2, uh, you have that, um, you know, do not judge or you too will be judged. Um, it means uh, do not uh, condemn other people because the measure how you um, uh, treat other, you will be treated. And of course, God will do his judgment about um, everyone. Else. 
but here is about us, how we are using our judgment, how we speak, how we treat each other, how we relate to each other people. And this is uh, what is in the background of this text. I'm also reading here a nice comment, uh, a positive one, affirmative one. How far have we gone in the development of our understanding of the judgment since the, day as, the days of Desmond Ford? Just a comment here. Uh, yes. Followed by another question and a comment. How can a loving God and Father reveal to humanity through Christ as a lamb who never hurt a fly, but healed all who came to him, annihilate anyone or anything for that matter? It just does not fit. Well, I don't know if I understand the question, but... I can read it again, if you want. Well, well even, even you will read uh, again. I don't know if I really catch the, the point of the question, but I think that uh, the author is asking how people who did not hear about Christ uh, can be saved. Uh, and um, to that, I would say that um, God has different ways how to uh, uh, come to um, people uh, through different means. And um, uh, the most important is that when uh, the light God is giving through different ways uh, to that people, this light is the light of the um, uh, Holy Spirit. And uh, uh, this, uh, I would say, the uh, Spirit of Christ. And if these people respond positively to the light God is giving them in their heart, in their mind, and respond to that small light uh, in the right way, they, these people can be saved, even though they did not hear the fullness of the gospel. Mm -hmm. God knows the circumstances of life and Romans chapter two, especially has uh, this uh, uh, in, in mind when, uh, when Paul is, is uh, speaking about how the heathens uh, can be saved. And it's interesting that also in uh, one of the minor prophets, Zechariah, is um, uh, showing that uh, in the new earth, there will be people who will ask Jesus, what are these wounds um, here um, uh, on, on your hand? And he will explain them the whole story uh, of uh, his death uh, and the meaning of it. So yes, th there will be saved people and, um, who did not hear the fullness of the gospel. Um, but uh, still, they responded to the light God gave, gave them. And because they responded positively, if God will um, give them more light, they will be also responding positively. Um, so they were on that journey. And the journey started in the right way, in the direction, and they will continue if they had the chance. Uh, so, and God knows um, uh, the heart and minds. So these people could be, could be saved because they responded positively to the spirit of Christ who was working on their heart. Thank you. Last question for tonight. And thank you for your patience. Uh, I appreciate it. Uh, and that question is, please explain how the three are one in 1 John chapter 5, verse 7. 1 John chapter 5, verse 7. How the three are are one that will be our last question and thank you for giving us a viewer time uh, as as we like to say in football this is extra time there usually after the two half times are over there is extra time and then there are penalties uh, we don't want to go into penalties we don't want to be penalizing <laughs> you <laughs> for staying with us neither uh, yes um, yeah. well uh, uh, what um, is um, uh, in uh, First John in chapter five, um, uh, the apostle doing here is that he is uh, showing uh, how the different testimonies um, about Jesus are um, unified, that they are not in contradiction, that they are speaking about the, the same. And um, uh, here you have uh, that um, you know testimony. Uh, this is the one who. Uh, uh, came by water and blood, Jesus Christ. He was baptized. He also died uh, uh, on the cross, uh, um, put his, uh, his death. He did not come by water, only by, by water and blood. This is that allusion to the um, 
uh, to the baptism and also to the death of Jesus. And it is the spirit who testifies. So no, this is not only water, blood, but also spirit, spirit of God who testifies. And then and with that, um, um, because the spirit is the truth, and then comes the verse seven, for there are three that testify, the spirit, the spirit of God, the water, it means that he followed um, God's instruction in baptism, and, uh, and God in baptism said, this is my beloved son, uh, in whom uh, I, have, um, I have delight, and then through the and the blood, which is uh, the sacrificial uh, death of Jesus on the cross, and there they are three in agreement because they are uh, saying uh, the same. We accept human testimony, but God testimony is greater because it is the testimony of God that Jesus Christ is really the Son of God. Doctor Moskala, thank you tremendously for your time. Thank you for giving us answers to the so many questions that came and we appreciate the fact that tonight we were blessed with you you as the dean of the seminary have given us a good taste of what goes behind the walls and the academic in the world of academia uh everyone who has been everyone who has been with you in your classes has felt the the, the academic challenge the stretching of the brain until it hurts and uh, of course it didn't hurt tonight we are blessed, but we did stretch our mind. Thank you for your presence, for Dr. Stefanovic's presence. Uh, th the fact that professors support each other and they hear this material and they know it speaks a very, very, gives a very positive message of what really goes behind, beyond the academia, a uh, friendly, uh, brotherly, uh, brother, sister support uh, among Seventh-day Adventists and who support not only the message, the mission of the church, but also support each other in their mutual work. Doctor, thank Amen. you very much. May God bless you and your family. Would you like to close with prayer and bless us? And I just want to remind everyone tomorrow, 7 p.m., please do not forget to join us tomorrow, 7 p.m. We are going to hear Esmond, <clears throat> Dwayne Esmond, on the sanctuary, its meaning for my Christian life and spiritual journey. And then Saturday, 11 o'clock, Eastern time here in North America, we are going to hear from Dr. Richard Davidson on the sanctuary from eternity to eternity. Please join us. Dr. Moskala, please pray for us. Yes, I will pray. Before I will pray, I would like to say uh, that it was a pleasure for me to be with you tonight and to study the word of God, um, uh, to be thrilled that God is our judge and is for us, never against us. And I would like to say that um, uh, my good uh, friend and brother, Ranko Stefanovic, uh, we uh, were teaching in the past when I was professor on uh, teaching, uh, we were teaching some classes together and we are till today teaching Sabbath school to, together. So this is, uh, this is good. Uh, and we are good friends and supporting each other. And we are on the same tune uh, because we love the Lord, our uh, Lord Jesus Christ and his word. And so, uh, we are united in this way. Thank you on behalf of all of us for your time, both of you, today and yesterday. Yeah, very good. So let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we really are thrilled to can, uh, that we can know you as our Creator, our Redeemer, our uh, personal friend, also our Judge and our Intercessor. Uh, you are everything for us. You are our Lord, our King. And we really want that you will rule in our lives. So again, this evening, after hearing this beautiful gospel about uh, you, that you are our judge, that you want to um, justify us, save us, deliver us from the power of sin, give us freedom, and that you are our vindicator, we want again to give ourselves into your hands, asking, please forgive our sins and fill us with your Holy Spirit. And by your grace, uh, uh, not only save us, but transform us, uh, mold us to your image, that we can be more and more in our character like you, that your character is our character, your purity is our purity, your righteousness is our righteousness. So we uh, thank you, we praise you for what you are doing every day for us, that you are our intercessor and our savior. So thank you that you are for us, never against us. 
that you gave um, uh, Jesus Christ for us, who is um, everything for us. Thank you for the Holy Spirit who is leading us into uh, all truths that we can relate to you, we can know you, we can worship you, we can follow you, we can speak about you. This is enabling uh, grace of God for us. So thank you for this good news about judgment and uh, help us not only marry you, but staying married with you and walking daily with you. Yes, we love you, Lord. Uh, we thank you for your faithfulness, for your kindness, um, for your grace, that you never treat us according to what we deserve, but always according to your grace and our needs, and we need you. So we give ourselves into your hands. Thank you for everything. Lead us and bless us that we can be blessing for others and always uplifting you as our Lord and Savior and uh, also proclaim it to the world that you will come soon. We thank you for that in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. And thank you very much for your presence. May God bless you all. Have a wonderful and pleasant night. Dr. Moskala, thank you again on behalf of all of us. Have a wonderful and pleasant night. And hopefully we'll see you again sometime soon next year. Okay. Quite likely Thank online you. again. Bye-bye. Praise now. the Lord. God bless you. Same to you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.